Hello everyone, my name is Mark McFarland and I'm the Feed Additive Product Manager for Lalamond Animal Nutrition in the UK and Ireland. Uh, welcome to this webinar dedicated to the farming process in sows. The presentations will last an hour and 15 minutes. As you'll hopefully have seen in the invitation, we've got two experienced speakers today in our very own David Sorno, a vet qualified in Spain, who's also our Global Swine Product Manager. And then we're very privileged to be joined by Dr. Emma Baxter, senior researcher from SRUC. This is the list of topics that we're going to get through today. The webinar is packed with information, hopefully not too much. Emma, as an animal behavioral scientist, will be focusing more on what's visible and what you should look out for around firing in both sow and piglet, while David's slides will delve into the invisible. So what's happening at the gut microbial level and how important it is in relation to pig health. Both presenters will overlap in certain areas, but both have their own unique insights and recommendations to share with you. I think that's everything now. So there'll be a slight delay as I hand things over to David. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope that you are doing well and uh, we are at the beginning of the end of this uh, pandemic and sooner or later we are able to meet each other and to talk about sows, about following the following process, etc., which is actually the topic of today. So this is the summary of the topics that I would like to present you. We are going to start describing farrowing as a hormonal storm and all the events that are happening around farrowing. Then we will go and describe constipation, the description of it and the consequences that it has. We are going to have a strong focus on the farrowing process, but under a microbiological perspective. And within that field, we will also have a look to the role of fibrolytic bacteria. And we will end our presentation uh, with the description of the microbial maternal imprinting concept, which is quite a new and interesting concept with a lot of interest uh, today. I would like to explain how is the sow during the gestation process itself. So when the sow is pregnant, the corporal lutea are developing in the ovaries and they secrete, they produce progesterone, which is the hormone in charge of keeping the, the pregnancy. And during approximately two thirds of the gestation period, we can see how there is a high level of progesterone in the blood of the sow, while all the other reproductive hormones are kept at low levels, at basal levels. When just before the farrowing process, when the piglets are developing and because of the activity of the piglet brain, there is a production of corticosteroids produced by the pituitary gland and by the adrenal gland. These corticosteroids will travel, will reach the placenta, will also reach the myometrium, and then the myometrium will produce prostaglandins. This prostaglandin will travel via the blood, the sow's bloodstream, will reach the sow's ovaries, the, and the corporal lutea will be Remove. As we can see here, precisely around farrowing, from a couple of days before farrowing and during the farrowing process, there is a very big change in the hormonal profile of the sows. The prostaglandins will show F2 alpha, will show a very clear peak, while at the same time, the progesterone levels will be coming down to basal levels. All the other reproductive hormones like prolactin. Prolactin is little by little increasing uh, during those few days around farrowing. The oxytocin will show a peak and then it will start to show a pulse activity. The estrogens will show an increase around farrowing and then it will decrease to basal levels. Something else which is happening around farrowing is something that we need to pay attention is the evolution of the feed intake and the fiber intake. Here in this uh, research from Ann Cools, we are comparing sows fed at libitum from different breeds and we can see how in a sow which is fed at libitum there is a reduction of sow feed intake around farrowing but this reduction is very close to the farrowing process itself while uh, when we compare it with the usual practice 
that we are doing at farm level when we are restricting the sow feed intake since a few days before farrowing, but also during the first days of lactation, we can see how the feed intake of the sow is much lower than what the sow would be doing under natural conditions. It is lower also because it will be reflected with the feed intake that will happen later on during lactation. Apart from that decrease on the feed intake around farrowing, it is also important to notice that typically when the sows enter to the farrowing room, there is also a change of diet. The sows are offered lactation diet instead of gestation diet. And the lactation diet typically contains much lower amount of fiber compared to the gestation diet. When we put together the lower feed intake after farrowing, and also the lower feed intake, uh, the lower fiber content of the diet, what we can notice is that there is huge decrease on the neutral detergent fiber intake of the sows around farrowing. There is a low amount of fiber reaching the gut. All these several factors lead to sows constipation. What is constipation? Well, the visible signs is something that uh, everybody is familiar with. So when the sows are not defecating, they are not producing feces, or the quality of the feces is these very hard fecal pellets behind the sow. This is a signal of constipation. It is also very typical in humans, females, and we can uh, use this scoring that was developed by Claudio Oliviero. He was developing a constipation index in which we can go from zero, which would be the absence of feces, then one would be dry and pellet feces, etc. And we can go to the other extreme in which number five would be very wet feces, uniform and liquid, so diarrhea type feces. Here in this graph, uh, you can see the constipation index around farrowing with two different diets, a high fiber content diet or a low fiber content diet. As you can see in both cases, during a few days around farrowing, there is a clear signal, a clear reduction of this constipation index. But with the high fiber content diets, the constipation index is only, uh, let's say, below what is considered as normal during only three days, while in the low fiber diet, the, this constipation index needs much more days, many more days to become again normal. What are the consequences of constipation? Well, when the sow is constipated, it is related with lower, with a weak microbiota diversity. There is a high oxygen content in the lumen because when the intestine is in the wrong metabolic status the intestine itself is releasing oxygen into the lumen and as a consequence there is going to be a dysbiosis. As a consequence of that there is going to happen a decrease of the intestinal peristaltic movements there is going to happen a modification of the gut microbial balance and especially, and this is something that we are going to see later when we will have a look to the microbiological characteristics around farrowing, we are going to see an overgrowth of aerobic gram-negative population, especially E. coli strains, but some other gram-negative bacteria also. One of the characteristics of, the, of this enterobacteria is that the lifespan of these bacteria is very short, so they multiply fast, but they also die very fast. And when they die, they release uh, what is known as endotoxins, which is the lipopolysaccharide, which forms part of the uh, bacterial cell. This lipopolysaccharide will be able to penetrate through the intestinal wall, will be passing through the bloodstream, and uh, it can perturbate the hormonal cycle leading to interferences with the milk production and leading to the mastitis, mamitis, mastitis agalaxia syndrome and also it will impact the preparation of colostrum. So as we have seen constipation is considered as a major risk factor for mamitis, mastitis agalaxia and so we are going to have 
more bacterial toxins uh, reaching the other. It will also be related with the cell mortality, leading to organ torsions, to urinary diseases. But apart from that, there is a correlation between the uterus and the intestine activity, meaning that when the sow is constipated, when the intestine is blocked, the feces are not moving, are not passing through the intestine, there will, there, there will also be a correlation with the uterine activity. The farrowing process will also be more difficult and, of course, this is going to have consequences on the farrowing duration and the vitality of the piglets, but all of that we are going to see it later. Something else that I would like to mention is that here we can follow the evolution of the fecal concentration of lipopolysaccharide in relation to the farrowing time in sows. As you can see here, a peak of lipopolysaccharide in the feces of the sows around farrowing. So we can see how the levels of lipopolysaccharide, the concentration, is higher three days before farrowing and also three days after farrowing. Later on during the lactation, the lipopolysaccharide concentration in the feces will come down. As I was mentioning before, once lipopolysaccharides have multiplied and they died, the lipopolysaccharide concentration can interfere with the metabolism of the sow. Among other things, what it can do is to suppress the release of prolactin, and we need to take into account that prolactin is related with maintaining colostrum and milk production. It will also decrease the amount of circulating thyroid hormone, which is related with the synthesis of milk, and it increases the concentration of progesterone and cortisol. Here in this graph on the right, we can see how during the first days after farrowing, there is an increase of lipopolysaccharide in the milk. So one of the consequences of this constipation, trying to make the, sh the shortcut, is that when we have sows which are more constipated, we are going to see less colostrum or released by the sow. Constipation is also related with what is happening later on uh, during the lactation period of the sow. And especially lactation is a critical period because we want the sow to eat as much feed as possible because the sow needs to produce huge amounts of milk for the for the piglet development. And when the sow is constipation around farrowing, we are going to see less feed intake during the whole lactation. It can be this feed intake reduction happen up to 30 kilos in a 21 days lactation. And especially the main feed intake reduction as we are see here is happening between 7 and 11 days after farrowing. This is actually a trial that we did uh, several years ago in which we can see how here in the scale of days that the sows took to start defecating after farrowing. We can see for the sows which are showing a severe constipation level, so sows uh, taking five and six days to start defecating, we can see how the feed intake is much lower and there is a very clear difference compared to the sows which were defecating already two, three or four days uh, after farrowing. But here you can see how there is a clear correlation between the constipation level and the feed intake. Now, as I was mentioning before, this is a research from, uh, again, from uh, Claudio Oliviero, and he's relating the constipation index that I was explaining before, 1.9, it would be considered as normal, and below 1.9 is uh, that the sows are showing some degree of constipation. And what we can see is that there is a correlation between the constipation score and the duration of farrowing. So what we can see is that when the sows are having, are showing a constipation score lower than 1.9, the farrowing process is expected to be longer. Here we can see how the litter size and the evolution of the litter size along the past uh, 25 to 30 years have also had a strong impact on the farrowing duration. 
So now I pass on to uh, Emma. Hi there, thanks very much for inviting me to um, talk to you um, at this PIG webinar on the farrowing process in sows, developments and consequences. For this section of the webinar, I'm going to concentrate on the sow and the behavioural signs of farrowing. And this will include a reminder of what we normally expect to see in the periparturant period before talking about the risks for disrupting that normal behaviour and then the consequences for the sows, but obviously the piglets and the farmer. I'll focus on aspects of sow stress and pain and then fatigue um, before looking at mitigation factors. And hopefully you will see some synergies with what David has already covered. So David spoke about the hormonal storm of firing and showed this slide. And sow behaviour in those final few days leading up to firing is influenced by and influences those hormone levels. So if we focus in on the 48 to 24 hour period pre firing this is actually when nest building behavior starts. It's initiated via a rise in hormone levels and it's stimulated externally via the provision of appropriate nesting substrates and space. And I'll go through this timeline in more detail because I really want to emphasize how important uh, nest building behavior is for successful farrowing and lactation. It starts properly in the 48 hour to 24 hour period before farrowing. There's this prolactin increase, progesterone decrease, and this is accompanied by an increased activity. So if we were to watch sows under kind of semi-natural conditions, this is when sows would separate from their sounder. They're trying to nest site the seek and they really do increase their activity. And we see that restlessness in sows in indoor environments. And this graph here by Ozak et al has just pulled out a typical nest building file of a typical sow in the 24 hours before farrowing. And within this graph, we see things like exploratory behavior, pouring, pen manipulation and straw rack manipulation. And it's fairly typical. It reaches its peak around 16 to eight hours pre farrowing. And what we see is that sows will carry and arrange the substrate they'll pour and root. And these particular behaviours are correlated with specific reproductive hormones, but also these behaviours influence somatostatin. So we, we also see a decrease in appetite at this time. So what happens is sows switch from ingesting a lot of forage material, if it's available to them, to carrying and depositing it. And it's perfectly normal in a healthy sow to actually see this reduced appetite around this time. Then what happens about eight to six hours pre firing is we get this sharp oxytocin rise and then nest building activity starts to reduce. Then we go into the quiet phase and this can start as early as four hours pre firing It's epitomized by an increased lateral lying behavior by the sow. And then when she's lying down, she also increases things like back arching. She'll pour and paddle and she'll she'll move that back leg forward. So essentially what's happening is she's cramping as the oxytocin levels are elevated and there are spontaneous uterine contractions. And this graphic at the top, I know it's not particularly clear, but essentially this just shows you the increase in that back arch pouring and back leg. And this is work done by Sarah Eisen. Then we're getting closer to birth and here the sow is quiet. Again, she's lying laterally as she'll start to cramp and you might see fluids. There'll be this pouring and paddling and tail flick and then birth. And typically in a, in a normal firing, you'll kind of see a progression of birth intervals of about 10 to 20 minutes. When you start to go above 20 minutes between piglets, you can start seeing pigs that are born either stillborn or compromised. So nest building behavior prepares the sow physically and behaviorally for farrowing, and it's considered a behavioral need whereby performing it increases the sow's biological fitness because it promotes good maternal qualities, but also preventing it can actually result in a negative welfare state. And this was demonstrated by Alastair Lawrence and Susan Jarvis in their work back in the 1990s, measured plasma cortisol levels in gilts farrowing in either crates, which are represented by the solid line here, and the solid bar or in pens with substrate, which are represented by the dash line and bar. And this work basically showed the stress response around this time. And what they demonstrate that cortisol levels rose in both treatment groups around farrowing as farrowing became more imminent, and that's not unusual, but levels were significantly higher in the crated sows compared to those that were loose. 
and they postulated that the increased stress response was a result of increased frustration as a result of the inability to perform satisfactory nest building behavior. So, yeah, sows tend to be more stressed if they're kept in farrowing crates. And, you know, this work was done in the mid to late 90s, but it's since been shown again by Oliverio. Um, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, um, who demonstrated this in salivary cortisol, the same profiles as well. And since then, there's been other work demonstrating that a failure to provide for this behavioural need of nest building behaviour um, can actually negatively impact the piglets through increased risks of savaging, particularly in gilts. And there's also this increased activity during farrowing, which increases crushing risk. So basically what happens is the sows are continuing to try and nest build and the piglets are coming at the same time. So you can see how there would be this increased risk of crushing during farrowing. The basic mechanism linked to these negative behaviours is that stress activates brain opioid pathways. This inhibits oxytocin release. We know that opioids are important in preventing pain and may actually promote passivity postnatally, which is exactly what you want to be able to promote piglet survival. You've got a sow there that's 250 to 300 kilos and you have a piglet that's, you know, under a kilo and a half, sometimes under a kilo. You don't want the sow moving about. You want her to be passive, exposing her udder for long periods of time to allow safe access for the piglets. Other research by the Finnish group um, has demonstrated the impact of farrowing environment on oxytocin levels and on farrowing duration. So this graph here shows that crated sows have lower oxytocin levels, which are shown in these dark bars, and they also have these longer farrowing durations, which are shown in the, in the grey bars, compared to animals that were kept in, in pens. And we know that insufficient oxytocin at parturition is important cause of prolonged farrowing duration. And when we have prolonged farrowing duration, there's obviously an increased risk of stillbirth or an increased risk of piglets that are born hypoxic and, and therefore have a high risk of dying in that very those very early hours postnatally. And there's quite compelling evidence. Again, there's a review here. If you click on this hyperlink, you can go to an open access article from the Gestating and Lactating Sow book. And it's quite compelling because it shows it's grouped a few studies together showing farrowing duration and average stillborn number when sows are kept in crates compared to pens. And you can see that there are these higher stillbirth levels and longer farrowing durations. And there's this this pattern is repeated in quite a few studies. Other factors influencing farrowing duration include things like heat stress, but also pain. And, you know, there's kind of a, a circular uh, aspect happening here, a, a feedback loop. The more in pain, the more farrowing difficulties and then the longer the farrowing duration. And one major aspect that's already been spoken about by David is the issue of litter size. And litter size certainly impacts farrowing duration. So farrowing duration for modern hyperprolific sows has increased by approximately 150 minutes. So your standard typical sow used to average a farrowing duration of about four hours, maybe with a range of three to five hours. And now the hyperprolifics are averaging seven and a half hours, sometimes all the way up to nine hours. So this is a, a marathon or a couple of marathon events for these sows. And when you have these longer farrowings, you have a higher risk of sows suffering both maternal fatigue or and, you know, uterine fatigue. Um, and when that happens, piglets are obviously experiencing oxygen deprivation and there's a high risk of stillbirth or uh, compromised piglets postnatally. Let's first look at how we might be able to conquer farrowing fatigue, um, which is obviously a particular risk for these hyperprolific sows. There's some interesting work coming from Peter Thiel's group at Aarhus University, suspecting there was an increased issue with maternal fatigue in these hyperprolific sows. They look back through their various experiments on nutrition of the gestating and lactating sow and found that farrowing duration was influenced by the time since the last meal. So this graph shows you the farrowing duration and the time from the last meal until the onset of farrowing in the various uh, experiments that they clustered together. And they demonstrated that the time lag from food to farrow was impacting farrowing duration. So farrowing duration was fairly constant if that food to farrow time lag was no more than three hours, whereas farrowing duration increased to over nine hours if farrowing started eight hours after the sow had consumed 
her last meal. So this is a significant finding and it, it sort of makes perfect sense that there would be a problem, especially as many sows want to farrow undisturbed, so tend to hold off until the night, until everybody's gone home. So let's say the sows are given their last meal at 3 p.m. before the stock workers go home. They might not start farrowing until you know 6 a.m. the following morning. So that's you know 15 hours since their last meal, and and then their farrowing could be incredibly long. You know, could be nine hours, uh, based on some of the reports about hyperprolifics. So there's of course an issue with energy status and success of farrowing for all parties. It's kind of compounded because farmers are reducing the feed for the sows around this time to reduce the risk of MMA. And generally, sows have this reduced appetite that I, I mentioned in my earlier slides. So many factors are combining to increase the risk of farrowing problems. It's perhaps not surprising then that the same authors found that there were higher stillbirth rates in farrowings when this delay in food to farrowing was over six hours, as shown in this graph. They decided to look at optimizing nutrition via higher fiber feeding. So again, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the benefits of, of high fiber feeding, especially in the transition period. In a particular experiment that they did, sows in a treatment group were fed dietary fiber supplement in their gestation diet from about day 102 to 108 of gestation. And then again in their transition diet from about 109 days into gestation until farrowing, whereas the control group was fed a kind of normal diet. And they saw that there was a significant reduction in the number of stillbirths in the high fiber treatment group, and therefore uh, obviously a reduction in total mortality. So why was this happening? You know, what was the mechanism behind this? They looked more closely at the energy status of sows and their blood work. This graph shows you blood glucose levels one hour after the birth of the first piglet against the time since the last meal and the onset of farrowing. And the energy status of sows is, you know, unsurprisingly influenced by the time since the sow had her last meal. But you can see that the sows receiving the high fiber supplement could maintain higher plasma glucose levels than those on the low fiber diet. So this obviously has implications for uh, recommendations around what to feed the animals around transition time as they move into farrowing. They also noted that the number of meals per day could be influential with animals receiving three meals a day having shorter durations of farrowing than those uh, receiving the two meal a day uh, option, which is kind of the standard option. From this work, they've demonstrated that a substantial proportion of sows suffer from low energy status at the onset of farrowing, and this negatively affects the farrowing process. So the recommendation would be that sows should be fed at least three daily meals in, in late gestation. Um, this can start as late as two weeks pre-farrowing and still have an influence on the farrowing process. And high fiber transition diets are likely to be optimal. One of the reasons for this is that they're likely to lower the risk of MMA. And um, we've already heard about the fact that fiber can relieve constipation and, and the, the fact that constipation has an effect on farrowing duration. But also this high fiber message is quite important because if farm staff hear that sows are going into a, the farrowing process in, in a state of uh, low energy, there could be that temptation to just simply increase their concentrate levels. Um, but then you forget that you shouldn't be doing that because if you do that, you are likely to get an increase in, in metabolic disorders. So the high fibre diet is a more sensible and sustainable uh, approach to trying to get higher energy levels for a sustained period of time for these sows. One last thing I'll mention within these recommendations as well is to make sure that water intake is good for the sows. So sows really do want to take on board an awful lot more water during the nest building period and around farrowing. And then, of course, in lactation, it increases a lot more when they're having to, to like take their, their neonates. So checking on flow rates and the quality of water is really important. Other ways that we might be able to reduce the stress in sows is to look at uh, environmental management. So the first thing is to look at heat stress in sows. I haven't uh, given you a lot of information about the implications of heat stress other than mentioning the aspect of it increasing farrowing duration. But we do know that sows are susceptible to heat stress, mainly during lactation. This is a period of high metabolic load that sensitizes the sows to their environmental temperature. And we think that hyperprolific animals actually are at greater risk of heat stress because of their metabolic load. 
just worth a kind of reminder about the thermal neutral zones of the animals. It's very difficult to get this right in the farrowing environment because the sows and the piglets have very uh, different needs. Newborn piglets have a thermal neutral zone up there at 28 to 31 degrees, of course. So when they're born, they're, they could be very chilled. But farrowing sows, although they have a higher tolerance around farrowing, so, you know, they can tolerate the 20 to 22 degrees, when it moves to lactation, they can get heat stress very quickly. So they want to shift their lower critical temperature down to about 16 degrees. Reducing stress for the sow also means promoting nest building behaviour. This is positive for the sow, but it's also positive for piglets and farmers. So there's evidence that maternal behaviours, uh, positive maternal behaviours are increased when nest building behaviour is satisfied. There's been effects showing reduced pre weaning mortality and, you know, just giving the simple act of giving sows burlap or hessian sacks actually can reduce activity during parturition and therefore obviously reduce crushing risk for the piglets. What about pharmaceutical interventions um, to help with things like uterine fatigue? When you, you hear that sows have stopped contracting, then it's very tempting to reach for oxytocin to try and get them going again. And whilst there is a place for this, it can also be misused and it can be quite dangerous for the piglets. So yes, oxytocin increases uterine contractions, but it can also compress the umbilical cord and this can decrease fetal heart rate and actually increase distress. And that's been demonstrated by Alonzo Spilsbury's group. This is a really nice graph kind of neatly demonstrating the effect of oxytocin. So we have fetal cardiac output in the solid line and we have intrauterine pressure measured in the dash line. And then the red arrow is when oxytocin was administered. So oxytocin is administered and about five minutes later, you have this big surge in intrauterine pressure. And then you can see the fall in fetal heart rate after that. And that's because that umbilical is being pressed. Piglets might be born dead if they've you know, suffered hypoxia during birth, but there can also be postnatal implications if they're born alive. So one of the things is that they can suffer from respiratory difficulties because of meconium aspiration syndrome. So what happens when they experience essentially fetal distress, when their umbilical cord is compressed, uh, the sphincter relaxes and re they release meconium into the amniotic fluid. Uh, there's a reflex of gasping and they can ingest that. Um, so they might get these respiratory difficulties. They can have heart problems. Uh, they can be brain damaged, uh, so they have reduced neonatal viability, an increased latency to perform important landmark behaviours, and an increased risk of hypothermia. And these pictures here just show you different gradations of meconium aspiration syndrome. In, in picture C there, that's a piglet that suffered an, a really poor birth, really difficult birth. And these piglets do need to be um, looked out for by the stock people, warmed up and helped onto the udder because they have had a, a difficult time coming out. So the recommendations here are to proceed with caution when it comes to, you know, immediate pharmaceutical interventions such as oxytocin. Only give it when absolutely necessary. Of course, do an internal exam first and clear any blocked piglets. Use a longer acting drug if necessary that doesn't give quite such a surge in pressure. Um, there are drugs out there. And it's always advisable not to give this to gilts, partly because you don't necessarily have a really good idea about their due date, but also gilts are very sensitive around their first farrowing and any and a, and a really painful or unpleasant first experience actually can affect them um, for, for subsequent litters. Consider pain relief, especially for gilts. So there has been some work showing that providing postnatal Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, especially for gilts, can have an impact on that post-farrowing performance. So the sows are a little bit more comfortable. The piglets suckle better because of that. And it's very important to determine whether it's uterine or maternal fatigue before uh, thinking about administering something like oxytocin. So the take home message from this section is that mothers matter. Our sows are really important. And farrowing is like an ultra marathon event now, averaging seven and a half hours. And we need to think about ourselves like top athletes and prepare them, get them fit for farrowing, get them fit for that marathon. So we should optimize their nutrition, encourage high water intake, decrease stress. And, you know, when things get tough, don't necessarily go immediately for the drugs. Thank you, Emma.
in this case, we can also see how the birth order, so those piglets that are born in the later positions, so in the, the those piglets with the later birth ranks, they are also showing a much more uh, like likelihood of being a stillbirth. Here we can see how the piglets which are born in positions one, two, or three, they have approximately only 2% of possibilities of being dead at birth, while the piglets which are born on the position number higher than 13, they have around 17% of possibilities of being dead. We need to take into account that today with the development of the hyperprolific uh, genetics, and uh, which is a clear trend in Europe at least, of course we have many sows which are following even not just above 13, but even above uh, 16, 17 piglets per, per following process. So uh, the likelihood of uh, having stillbirths is uh, increasing. Then we can also see if we want to focus on some molecular traits, we can also see how in the umbilical cord of those piglets there is also a clear correlation between the lactate that we can find in the umbilical cord of those piglets which are born in the last positions of the farrowing process. And we can also detect a reduction on the pH in the umbilical cord. There are several ways to define piglet vitality at birth. In this case, we are measuring the piglet behavior during the first 15 seconds of life, and the score goes from one, which are those piglets which are not breathing, not moving once they are born, to a score four, which are those piglets which are really moving around and really vital during those first 15 seconds of life. Piglet vitality at birth is related with uh, very important parameters, especially during the first three days of life. As an, ex as an example here, you can see how the vitality score is directly related with the survival rate of the piglets. Those piglets with a vitality score one have a much lower survival rate compared to the piglets in the other vitality scores and also with the average daily gain during those three days of life. As you can see the vitality score here, the, the higher the vitality score, the higher the growth of those piglets is going to be during those first three days of life. Now we are also going to see uh, what is the influence of the farrowing process and the vitality of the piglets on the colostrum. Here in this slide from Helen Kesnell, we can see that there is a correlation, it is a negative correlation between the number of stillborn piglets and the colostrum produced by a sow. So as you can see, when the number of stillborn piglets increases, we are going to have a lower amount of colostrum produced by the sow. Apart from that, we can also see, this is a, a research work that was done internally by Laleman Animal Nutrition, there is how there is a clear correlation between the vitality score of the piglets at birth and the time to suckle, so the, the, the time to find the teeth and start eating the colostrum. It was quite expected anyway that a piglet that was born with a lot of vitality was going to be also quite able to find the teeth and start suckling. Instead, there was no correlation with the time to break the umbilical cord. Some of the piglet, vital or not vital, they are able to break the cord and there is no correlation with that parameter. And also here in this research from the Claire, we can also see how the colostrum yield is going to be influenced by the application or not of oxytocin or by the application or not of manual help, manual extractions during the following process. In general, when we need to apply any external help to the sow during the following process, the colostrum production is going to be lower, as we can see here. And also here, when we add the, I mean, when we need to go and uh, help the sow to extract the piglets. So, in conclusion, what we could say, the most difficult, the farrowing process, the higher the percentage of stillborn piglets, or the lower the vitality score of the piglets, then either we are going to have less colostrum produced, or the piglets are going to take more time 
to find the teeth and start eating colostrum. And this is actually very important because, as you already know, the immunoglobulin G concentration in the colostrum drops quite fast. So the immunoglobulin G at the beginning, when the first piglet is born, is quite high. But then little by little, we can see a very fast drop on the levels of immunoglobulin G. This is important because immunoglobulin G is going to be the main source of passive immunity to the piglets. The piglets, when they are born, they are not able to produce an adequate immunological response and they actually need to absorb immunoglobulin G from the colostrum. For those piglets which are born later, which are born in the, late, uh, in the latest positions or which are born very late in the long farrowing process, they are going to have access to, first of all, to a lower amount of colostrum, but also they are going to have access to a much poorer colostrum from, a, from an immunological standpoint. So those piglets, they are going to be less protected and this is something that they are going to be carrying out their life, uh, especially during the lactation and during the weaning period. So now I will pass on to uh, Emma. So in this section, I'm going to focus on the piglets, looking at the behavioural and physiological signs of vitality before talking about postpartum risk factors for survival and then mitigation. There are many predisposing risk factors for piglet mortality and piglet physical viability and behavioural vitality are major aspects in determining survival. And they are influenced by uh, genetic and environmental factors. Perhaps the most influential factor in recent years has been the impact of large litter size on the vitality of the neonate. And this graphic by Farmer and Edwards highlights the contributing roles of intrauterine growth restriction, physiological immaturity at birth and hypoxia during farrowing on low neonatal vitality and how this manifests in the piglets and how that all contributes to neonatal mortality. It has long been established that low birth weight is one of the major risk factors for piglet mortality. This graph highlights that being born under one kilogram in weight is associated with high levels of mortality. It has also long been known that increase in litter size is associated with a reduction in the mean piglet birth weight and a parallel increase in within litter variation in birth weight, leading to a rise in the proportion of small piglets. This graph, courtesy of Bentham de Grave, which is published in a, in a recent review my colleagues and I wrote, demonstrates how, as litter size increases still further, the proportion of low birth weight piglets continues to increase progressively. In humans, an APGAR score is widely used to measure immediate post-birth vitality, Scores have also been developed for piglets ranging in complexity. For example, the viability scores developed by Randall and then enhanced by Zaleski and Hacker in 1993. In work we did on piglet survival indicators, we also developed a piglet vitality score. You've already heard a little bit about it. And here we simply just scored what piglets could do within 15 seconds of birth. And that ranged from sort of no movement or breathing, in other words, stillbirth, all the way up to a score of four where piglets demonstrated good movement, good breathing, and they attempted to stand. We also um, tried to take this a step further and quantify vigor. So we had newborn piglets interact with a dummy teat that was attached to pressure sensors, and this quantified how vigorously they nuzzled or rooted that teat. And this was based on the observations of piglets teat seeking and massaging the udder and the apparent variation in how vigorously uh, individuals would do this. This graph here uh, shows you the, the average results from the piglets that we measured. It shows you the distance they moved the dummy teat within a 30 second time period. The difference between piglets that survived to weaning and those that born alive but subsequently died. The polar plots are here just to give you a visual idea of this, of this rooting behavior and this variation in vigor. And the interesting thing about this work was that it was completely independent of body weight. So we found this significant result between the two population of piglets, and it didn't matter if they were small. Basically, small, vigorous piglets can survive. So if small piglets do survive, they, they will have these challenges, not least because they are at a higher risk of, of being chilled. 
Um, this graph is from Peter English's work back in the 1980s when they did quite an intensive measurement regime taking piglet rectal temperatures frequently over a 36 hour period and then classifying piglets according to their body weight. And it's resulted in this really lovely graphic which shows you the difference in core body temperature between piglets that are over 1.5 kilos represented in the red line piglets between 1 and 1.5 kilos in the yellow line, and then piglets born under a kilo um, in the green line. And what I want to show you is, first of all, in that first 10 minutes, 20 minutes after birth, all piglets experience a sharp temperature drop. But piglets under a kilo in birth weight maintain a lower core body temperature compared to their larger litter mates. The other thing I want to show you is that temperature does pick back up. This is through various mechanisms, including shivering thermogenesis. But one of the reasons that they manage to pick their temperature back up is through their behavior and through their vigor. I wanted to demonstrate to you the relationship, if you like, between thermoregulation and behavior by using a series of, of infrared thermography pictures. So if we take this pig that it's been away from the udder um, since birth, and it's become compromised, it's very chilled, um, it's not been able to take on board colostrum, which obviously contains IgGs, but also fats and proteins that it's able to metabolize to generate body heat. And you can see that this piglet's become hypothermic. In contrast, these two images just show you slightly different profiles here. Um, two piglets at the udder. We can see that the, the first one that's actually suckling its, its radiant body heat is much warmer than the one that's leaning on its back. The one that's leaning on its back um, is still covered in placental fluid and you can see it's still it's quite chilled. These images do show you how warm piglets can get once they're suckling. They're getting that because they're metabolizing colostrum, but they're also getting this radiant body heat um, from the udder. And that's very much demonstrated in this thermal image as here, here that shows you this successful uh, suckling of the litter at the sow's udder. And behavioral landmarks are in, incredibly important for survival. So we know that piglets that are quicker to reach the udder, find a functional teat and suckle are more likely to survive than those uh, that take their time doing that. Let's move on to mitigation and think about some of the management strategies that might be adopted to try and promote piglet survival. Some of the strategies to decrease stress and enhance our welfare that I talked about earlier will also promote piglet survivability via improved maternal behavior and maternal provisioning. But managerial interventions will be required to help piglets, particularly in large litters and particularly piglets that are identified as at risk. Identifying piglets at risk can involve looking at the physical characteristics. So these piglets marked with a red cross are those that have the severe IUGR status and really need to be humanely euthanized as they probably have these pathological impairments. Um, we then have both big and small piglets that are, are vigorous and showing good vitality and signs of life. Um, and then we have, you know, ones like the, the one here with the question mark on that does have some signs of moderate uh, growth retardation, but managed correctly actually may survive quite well. And don't forget to look at things like meconium aspiration syndrome and meconium staining. No matter what the size, if piglets are covered in this kind of brown staining, like, like you can see pictured here, these are piglets that have had a difficult birth and those piglets need to be helped, warmed up, dried off and, and helped to the udder. Piglets in a large litter are going to be at risk. Studies have shown that approximately 30% of hyperprolific sows deliver insufficient colostrum for the size of their litters. And it's really important to obviously notice when a litter is struggling, notice when there are more piglets than functional teats and deal with that quite early on. It can quickly manifest itself into a more chronic problem. So here we have piglets that are starving. They're starting to crowd underneath the udder when the sow is standing up, um, which means that they're going to be quite weak. If she lies down, she can easily crush them. Piglets quickly fall back and show these signs of starvation. And then there's the problem that if they're not suckling the mother, they have this swollen udder, can develop um, mastitis and things like that. So just this, this problem becomes chronic for both the piglets and the sows. So it's really important to maximize all piglets colostrum intake, but certainly help weak piglets and even hand feed colostrum if possible. This isn't a, a new message. Maximizing colostrum intake is important for all piglets, but we know that compromised piglets such as those with IUGR characteristics do not ingest enough colostrum 
And David has also highlighted that piglets born late in the birth order will not be getting optimum colostrum intake or quality. And intake is variable, so we know that, that some piglets will ingest between 200 and 450 grams. Actually, the main limiting factor is the sow. Piglets, if they are vital enough, they will uh, suckle a lot more. Previous research sort of said that below 200 grams, there was this six-fold increase in mortality. So there was this recommendation of 200 grams minimum. But actually, that's now changed. There's the latest research suggests that um, above 250 grams is recommended for good weight gain and survival. And actually, in this study by Hassan et al., it shows that not even 200 grams was enough for piglets to survive. So, yeah, maximum colostrum intake. It's also really important that the piglets do suckle from their own mother. It's critical for successful passage of lymphocytes. It can improve immune cell absorption if they can have some colostrum from their own mother. So that's why if cross fostering has to happen because of being in a large litter, it's recommended that that doesn't happen before six hours of age um, so that the, the piglets do have a, a good amount of time with their own mother's colostrum. In large litters where we have um, more piglets than functional teats, split suckling will help ensure colostrum intake for all piglets. So this is when you split the litter into two groups initially removing the heavier, stronger piglets and then placing them within a heated creep area or in a box, but making sure they are warm, but also have air. Then allow the smaller, less viable piglets to suckle and then swap the groups over after about 90 minutes. This would allow for at least two good sucklings based on milk letdown and colostrum letdown at, let's say, 40 minute intervals. Both groups of piglets should be able to access a warm environment and management of split suckling, be vigilant and keep an eye on when those timings are happening and who's swapping is really important. So it does take very good stock personship. At the University of Copenhagen, they've been conducting a programme of work specifically targeting the IUGR piglets. And one of the experiments involved giving colostrum supplementation. They have sort of mixed reports of success with colostrum supplementation. One of the experiments, they took these very little piglets and they simply uh, tube fed them with 12 mil per kilogram. And what they found is that they were able to improve thermoregulation in the, in the piglets that were given this, these colostrum boluses by one degree. So that's reasonably significant. When I say simply, it can be quite tricky to tube feed piglets with colostrum, but it can be done and can have some sort of effect. There's increased interest in energy supplementation to aid colostrum intake. And this is because piglets are born with very low energy reserves. So glycogen is the most important energy store in newborn piglets. It's available in their liver and their, their muscle. It's been estimated, though, that normal glycogen reserves in newborn piglets can meet their energy needs for only seven to eight hours. And actually, this, this work was done back in the 1970s. And you can see from this table, you can see how quickly the reserves are depleted, again, from work done in the 1970s. But genetic selection for lean tissue growth and high litter size has resulted in these smaller piglets, including ones that we, we know are born with altered organ and muscle development. So those depletion rates are likely to be faster. It's quite clear that the body, body energy reserves of piglets do not cover the high energy demands for thermoregulation, locating the udder, competing for a teat, and then, you know, avoiding uh, sour posture changes. So failure to acquire a sufficient amount of energy is suggested to be a greater risk factor for neonatal mortality than failure to acquire a sufficient amount of IgG. And so the recommendations are to provide energy that will promote suckling. In other words, promote the acquisition of sufficient colostrum. There are less invasive supplementation programs that could help weak or small piglets. And these are based on quite a growing body of work in the area. And it means that there are, there's the ability to kind of provide recommendations about the best way to administer supplements. The first thing is to warm the piglets before they receive these supplements. And then the energy type and the quantity is important. So each dose of product selected should give enough energy to the piglets, but not uh, make the piglets feel too full, because if they're too full, they won't go and suckle at the udder. As lipids are the most important source of energy for neonatal piglets, most commercial energy supplements are fat based, either using long chain fatty acids or medium chain fatty acids in their formulation. Actually, work suggests that the oxidation rate of medium chain fatty acids are, is faster than that of long chain fatty acids. And therefore, 
they can cover a greater part of the piglet's energy expenditure. So, so generally that kind of energy type better. More than one dose is required in the 24 hour period. So, so it's sort of this, this regular keeping on top of things. It's also important to check your energy product is actually for newborns and not just electrolytes for the piglets to drink themselves. And finally, of course, the sow, don't forget the sow. Timing for the supplement is important. It should be given whilst the sow is still producing colostrum. So the earlier, the better. So really what we're talking about here is supervising farrowings in order to identify these little piglets or piglets at risk, provide them with warmth and energy so that they can drink from their own mother and acquire sufficient colostrum. When piglets are first born, their lower critical temperature is 34 degrees. So in a typical farrowing house of between 20 and 22 degrees, piglets will of course become rapidly chilled. And this diagram just shows you where they're losing heat. But these processes also are costing the piglets energy, particularly things like amniotic fluid removal. It's typically done by evaporation if there's nothing kind of drying the piglets off. And this represents a very large energy expenditure for the piglet. Mitigation of heat loss and indeed energy loss is by improving the microclimate for the piglets. Work done back in the 1960s by Mount demonstrated that just 2.5 centimetres of straw decreased heat loss by 40%. There are other ways that staff might do this using things like uh, shredded paper, although that can become quite mulchy. Other ways of improving the microclimate, of course, is to provide supplementary heat sources. Currently, the microclimates we see for piglets in most farms, I would say, are in inadequate, and actually the piglet behaviour tells you that. And under the EU directive for pigs, there are regulations about the areas for piglets so that they can all rest together comfortably. And for large litters, this means we should be increasing that space quite a lot and making it more thermally protective. You know, there's work been done in Denmark quantifying the optimum space to meet the regulations and protect the piglets all the way through to weaning. And at the moment, the, the, the environments and the space we provide is just, it's just not adequate, it's not enough. So we can improve the microclimate, um, firstly, by simply covering the creep area and providing that creep area nice and close to the udder of the sow. There's also evidence that radiant heat lamps are better than the standard heat lamp at giving a better spread of heat for all the piglets. So this is shown in this diagram here. And then the thermal images of these different lamps show you that the radiant heat source just gives this much better spread. So we don't have this spotlighting in traditional lamps. The take home message is that you can identify neonates at risk based on their physical and behavioural signs of vigour. An early intervention can save vulnerable piglets, but it's important to provide that effective microclimate, help those weak and vulnerable piglets, including those ones that may have suffered a poor birthing process, consider the energy supplementation to promote colostrum acquisition, and importantly, maintain vigilance of litters to spot signs of piglets falling back and therefore to prevent further concerns for both the piglets, the sow, and of course, therefore, the farmer. Thank you, Emma. Now we are going to have a look to what is happening from a microbiological perspective. I will try to start from some simple messages and slides. At birth, the gastrointestinal tract is sterile or almost sterile. And once the piglets are born, the piglets are exposed to a huge variety of microbes from the vagina, from the feces, from the skin, from the environment, farrowing room itself, from the farrowing pen, that will colonize the gut extremely fast. After 12 hours only, we can find 10 to the ninth CFU per gram of colonic content. When we talk about microbiota in general, when there is an empty space that uh, needs to be colonized, that needs to be occupied, that's a great opportunity for pathogens. So this is a risky period for the piglets because depending on what is the composition of that uh, microbial colonization, it can develop to a homeostatic and proper development, or either it could lead to uh, some pathology, to some diarrhea, and, and eventually a mortality, etc. It is. It has already been described that there is a high similarity between the flora of the piglets and the flora of the mother, and the first bacteria are very diverse. Once the bacteria are colonizing the, uh, the gastrointestinal tract, these first colonizers will modify the gastrointestinal environment. 
I would like to present here an, uh, a research that we did uh, in a trial that we carried out in which we compared the alpha diversity of the sows before farrowing and after farrowing. This alpha diversity takes into account the number of bacterial species, but also if, if some species are more dominant than the others. Here, what you can see is that in the microbial profile of sows before farrowing, and actually this was five days before farrowing, the microbial alpha diversity was higher compared to the alpha diversity of the sows after farrowing. In this case, it was 24 hours after farrowing. This is important because this is telling us that the microbial profile is losing diversity during the farrowing process, the microbial profile of the sow. And also it is telling us that there is a huge change in the microbial profile during that time. In this specific case, we also applied a probiotic and we compared to a group including a probiotic. And what one of the conclusions that we were able to get is that we could modulate this reduction of alpha diversity with the application of the probiotic. Here we can focus on some specific groups of bacteria which are important either for the sow, either for the piglet. In some of these groups, the firmicutes, as you can see again, when we compare the control group before farrowing and after farrowing, and here we are measuring the relative abundance of those groups. The firmicutes, they are, actually the firmicutes are usually the family of bacteria which occupies the bigger space in the microbial profile. And as you can see, there is a huge drop on the firmicutes relative abundance before farrowing and after farrowing. Proteobacteria is a group of gram-negative bacteria, enterobacteria, including Campylobacter, Escherichia, Sigella. And what we can see here is that there is a huge increase, a huge over-multiplication of the proteobacteria around farrowing. Okay, in this case, we can also see how we can modulate that with the application of a probiotic. But this is related actually, this increase of proteobacteria with what I was mentioning before about the development of E. coli and then the release of lipopolysaccharide. And finally, there is another group, the fibrobacteres, and the fibrobacteres, especially before farrowing, they can also be modulated. These fibrobacteres are bacteria, we are going to see that later, that are able to produce short-chain fatty acids. With the fibrobacteres, also, we can modulate the uh, relative abundance of fibrobacteres with the addition of probiotics. So here, this is what uh, I would like to mention regarding the uh, fibrobacteres and in general, the fibrolytic bacteria. If we analyze the digestion process in the sow, the, the gastrointestinal content pass, passes more or less fast through the small intestine. It takes from two to six hours. But then most of the time, the gastrointestinal content stays in the hindgut, uh, as you can see here, from 20 to 38 hours. And precisely in this hindgut, in the secum and in the colon, is where we can find a high amount of cellulolytic bacteria. This fibrolytic or cellulolytic bacteria, when they carry out their metabolism, they are able to release volatile fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And these volatile fatty acids, apart from passing and traveling through the bloodstream and reaching the liver, they can also be directly used by the enterocytes in the intestinal wall. Actually, it has been already established that the volatile fatty acids which are coming from fermentation in the hindgut, they are supplying up to 28% of the energy balance in growing pigs. And in sows, these uh, values can be even higher 
it can reach up to 45% depending on the diet composition, depending on the level of fiber and the type of fiber which is applied in the diet. But the message that I would like you to keep from this slide is that in sows, this uh, fermentation is representing a big percentage of the nutritional value of the diet, especially of the energetic value of the diet. But of course, in order to have that fermentation happening, the sows need to be well equipped with the adequate, let's say, microbiological equipment. When it comes to swine, and when we try to identify the different factors that are also playing a role on the development of the piglet microbiota, there are also some sow effect, and here or we can wonder if the diet, and of course the diet has a, an effect on the microbiota, the parity of the sow, the supplementation with probiotics, and this gut microbiota in the sow can also have an effect on the milk composition. Then there will be an influence of, on the piglet microbiota, which is happening through the direct gut microbiota and transmission of microbiota from the sow to the piglet, and also some modification of this gut microbiota of the piglet through the influence of the uh, colostrum and milk composition. So depending on the nutritional composition of the colostrum and, and the milk, the immune quality and the nucleosides, the oligosaccharides that are included in that milk or colostrum. And all of that will shape the performance of the piglets, the health and robustness of the piglets, the eating behavior, and eventually also the reduction of antimicrobial use. Here I would like to present you this, I would say, quite nice paper, which is trying to identify the source of microbiological colonization of the piglets at birth. Here we can see how, if we take milk as an example, we can see how the milk during the first day of birth is having an influence at uh, all different intestinal divisions, so jejunum, ileum, secum, and colon. But something which is important to notice is that the milk, and here you can see the milk evolution, which is turning from light green to dark blue. In the small intestine, the milk composition is really having a direct influence on the microbial profile of the piglets. Instead, in the hindgut of the sow, this effect of the milk composition is much smaller, and I would say it is especially important on the first day, but later on, uh, the, the milk composition influence will be smaller and smaller. And what we can see in those piglets is that the influence of the fecal microbiota of the sow two days before farrowing, so what we can see here in light pink, is having quite an influence, a long influence on the piglet's microbiota up to 35 days after birth, as we can see here. So in the hindgut, the fecal composition of the sow will be very stable, shaping a part of the microbiota of the piglets. There were also, it is, and this is coming from the same research work, they were identified 24 types of bacteria which were directly transmitted from the sow to the piglet. And the researchers, they did, they established some positive and negative correlations with the gene expression in the piglet's intestine. This is this table that, uh, that you can see here. Actually, some of the genes that were influenced were actually linked with digestive health. So the conclusion that we can extract is that the microbial composition that the sow is transmitting to the piglets is actually shaping the intestinal health of those piglets, but also the immunological maturation of those piglets. Some of these of the genes that were affected by this bacterial transmission are porcine beta-defensin one and two, 
some genes related with the mucin production and also some genes related with the inflammatory response or to the TLR4 receptors. We are coming back here to an internal example from, from us, from Lalemand. In this trial that I was presenting before, in which we were comparing the fecal microbiota of the sows before farrowing and after farrowing, we also took samples of the piglets as long as 20 days after weaning. And the piglets, they were already receiving the same diet post weaning. And here, taking fecal samples of the piglets, we could still have a very clear identification of those piglets that had been lactating from a probiotic fed sow compared to those piglets that uh, had been lactating from a control sow. To me, this is precisely uh, talking about the maternal microbial imprinting concept. To me, this is something extraordinary how piglets that are uh, already, that have already been separated 20 days from their mothers, we can still very clearly separate the piglets depending on the addition or not of a probiotic in the sow's diet. Just to put some names, let's say, part of this differentiation in the microbial profile, in the sows we were uh, able to detect a higher abundance of fibrobacteres in the sows fed with the probiotic, and then in the piglets we were also able to find a higher detection of fibrobacteres in the piglet. The main message that we can extract from here is that the effect of the probiotic treatment of the sows is reflected in the piglet microflora after weaning. And just to finish, some take-home messages. The farrowing process is one of the most stressful periods for the sow. There is going to be an influence of the feed intake and the diet composition around farrowing. So uh, we have been mentioning that there is less fiber rich in the gut, less fiber intake actually. This is going to modify the microbial profile. There is a high risk of the sows being constipated due to a series of factors and as a consequence of that, uh, the constipation itself is also a strong risk factor for the farrowing process. Constipation is linked with the duration of farrowing, with the production of colostrum and also with the presence of neonatal diarrhea and it is also indirectly linked with the piglet's vitality at birth. So we should pay uh, a lot of attention to constipation, to those bacteria that are multiplying around farrowing and how they are going to affect the farrowing process itself, but also the piglets. We have also defined what is the role of the fibrolytic bacteria, which is a group of bacteria which is quite helpful for sows to extract more energy from the from the feed. And finally, we have been talking about the concept of maternal microbial imprinting, which is quite a new concept, but this is quite interesting because it's a concept that we can apply to improve actually the quality of the piglets, the microbial colonization of those piglets, and also it could be the start uh, process to improve how those piglets are going to be developing later on. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and please feel free for any question that you may have. Okay, so it's question time. Um... Hopefully Emma is able to turn on our camera now and join us. Hi Emma. Hello. Perfect, can hear you well. Um, unfortunately, David has had some issues with his computer, so hopefully he's gonna join us fairly soon. He's just oh, having gosh. to restart, sod's law. <laughs> I put the pressure um, on me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I have a few questions in for you already. Okay. So um, one of them pertains to uh, nesting. Um, so what, in your opinion, are the best nest building materials uh, sort of like commercially available uh, that could be used? Um, so uh, thanks for the question. Um, we we kind of know the gold standard uh, that sows want to nest build with uh, is straw. Um, and so, but we know that that's very tricky in most commercial systems. 
um, what there's been some additional work looking at um, shredded paper, uh, sawdust, wood shavings, um, and and also whole sheets of paper, and these mm -hmm. burlap sacks. So ideally, gold standard would be long stem straw, um, but in a crate, you want to make sure that's right in front of it in the trough, and then you want something that's also there um, that won't fall down the slats or go behind her and be frustrating. So something like a hessian or a burlap sack attached to the front of the crate, it gives a little bit of feedback. Um, and then actually there's been some work done by um, the group from Helsinki and Avaros's group showing that whole sheets of paper, sows much prefer whole sheets of paper than shredded paper because the shredded paper just falls through the slats or it just becomes mulch. Uh, it's it's never going to be quite as good as, you know, <laughs> letting her out and giving her a, a full nest, but it will reduce the frustration and um, reduce her stress levels. So yeah, um, whole sheets of paper, hessian sack attached to the front, um, ch chains and logs don't do anything for her. Okay, I'm afraid perfect. Thank you. I think David's there. David, can you hear me okay? Is your mic Yes, muted? I can hear oh, you, yeah. Mark. And, and I'm sorry, but I, I was left out just in the critical <laughs> moment. Eh? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's that. okay. <laughs> um, I've got uh, a question, a uh, very good question is, um, have you been able to track how human firing interventions on previous firings impact the subsequent firing success? So do sows become dependent on human intervention and do we create lazy sows? I guess maybe Emma, you could start there on that one. It's, it's a fairly interesting that's question. A, that. That's a really interesting question. Um, the most we know, I think, I, I, I don't know of, of um, tracking based on our interventions, but we do know that um, we get a repeat offenders when it comes to stillbirths. So um, gilts who had stillbirths in their first parity quite often give stillbirths, you know, the whole way through. And um, that's why farrowing records are really important because you can kind of keep an eye on ones that you might well then have to go and assist and help. Um, so we do know that there is this um, almost genetic element to um, stillbirths to a certain extent. In terms, I suppose it's almost like a bit of a circular argument as well, because it could also be that we've already intervened with those animals and given them obstetric assistance. And, and maybe they've had just a really poor farrowing experience full stop the first time round, and, and that has then damaged them you know, going yeah. on. And um, certainly, I think what we do know is that first farrowing for gilts is really important to make it as, you know, stress-free and comfortable as possible. Um, and uh, because it does affect them later on. So I don't know if we've made them more lazy, but we, th <laughs> that first experience is, is really important. Um, I don't know whether David has anything on, on that, because I know that you showed no, some I, results I, about I, obstetric I, assistance. I, I, I had misunderstood the question because I thought that it was more uh, related with the oxytocin injection, and uh, but, but uh, no, it, it was more referring to the to the previous following. Oxytocin injection, anyway, Emma, you have already uh, dealt with that uh, during your presentation. It's, uh, I mean, it, it depends a lot on the farm, but in some farms, uh, it is like quite easy to. Uh, to try to apply oxytocin injections to facilitate, to, uh, to, I mean, to speed up the farrowing process. And it is, as you have mentioned, associated with quite a few uh, risks, uh, and, uh, and especially when it is uh, applied too early. Okay. Um, I think we've got another one for David here. Uh, if the microbiota can be passed from sow to piglet, do you see any beneficial or negative effects on neonatal diarrhea? Well, actually, yes. Uh, I mean, it is uh, quite an important question and quite, a, and, and quite an important topic because the piglets, when they are born, they are born without, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they don't have any uh, microflora or they have uh, just very little microflora. So they are going to get contaminated and during the first hour, during the first day, uh, they, uh, the contamination is, is going to happen from the microbial environment, which is around the piglet. And as you can imagine, the microflora from the sow is a big part of that microbial environment. So during those uh, first hours, uh, first day, first couple of days, uh, yes, uh, the more hygienic, if we can say that, if we can say use that word when we talk about uh, fecal microbiota, etc., the more hygienic the microbiota is, 
the best profile of microbiota we are going to give to the piglets. If that is not, uh, if the profile of the microbiota is not good, uh, then there is a high risk on an immature piglet, which is usually small, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a high risk to develop uh, neonatal diarrhea, usually caused in many occasions by E. coli. There are also some virus uh, playing around there. But uh, Clostridium difficile and E. coli are usually the main uh, drivers for the bacterial neonatal diarrhea. Yeah, there's an, a nice comment from Simon there. He said, you know, it might be a naive question, but there's obviously the link here with poor biosecurity as well, in terms of uh, uh, hygiene as well, uh, being connected. Um, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Probiosecurity um, means uh, application of probiotic, you mean, to the... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe <laughs> um, uh, this is a, a, re a really interesting question, which I guess is more about knowledge exchange, which, uh, you know, uh, we have a comment here. Thank you both for the great presentation. Um, farmers are busy people and tend to know best and, and sometimes are reluctant to change. So what advice uh, can you offer someone who's advising them to best address these key topics to our farmer clients? Maybe not the topic of, of your presentations, but it's always an interesting one to get your message across. So I don't know about you, uh, Okay, well, I yeah, I, I try and speak to farmers quite a lot and I agree they know that they do know so much. You know, they're, they're a hive of knowledge themselves and the first thing is to compliment them on their, on their <laughs> hive of knowledge, um, you know, as the, as the person trying to kind of maybe disseminate some of these new bits and uh, then go straight for blaming the geneticists on any of the problems. <laughs> <laughs> and, there might know, be three geneticists on here. No, so, I know. No. I, I am only. I'm only being. I'm a bit being a bit facetious, but um, uh, yeah. I yeah. We we do have uh, there people. You know, people have been farming for a long time. It can be difficult to kind of change behaviour, and they've done what they've always done. But we don't have the same. We don't have the same genetics as we had a while ago. And those genetic advances, improvements, whatever you want to call them, they have created an animal that is more challenging for you know, for the people managing, for the people feeding them. And so it's probably more about just saying uh, you're doing a great job, um, but there are all of these additional challenges that, that maybe you don't recognise what's going on internally, certainly. Um, but I think a lot of the farmers pick up things like these little piglets and, the, you know, the growth retarded piglets and things like that, but they might not realise quite how, um, how pathologically, you know, uh, affected they are. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's maybe the conversation. So you're doing a great job, but we, we've changed these animals quite a lot and you must have realized over the years that this has become more challenging for you <laughs> maybe yeah. sympathize um, mm -hmm. and then and then disseminate if I don't know if that's helpful David might have uh, other suggestions there no I mean I think that the question itself is difficult eh? I mean because it's uh, very general and at the end of the day the farmers uh, what, what the farmers are doing every day is already from my perspective quite uh, it's not easy anyway so applying uh, yeah getting used as Emma was saying to the new genetics and the new challenges is uh, is hard I would say that there are uh, many things by the way to do uh, anyway so uh, from a farmer's point of view uh, i think that the best is try to learn every day and and try to implement the different uh, the different learnings but uh, i think that yeah. they are on the way anyway thank you uh, this is probably a, a quite a, a gb specific question so uh, david you might get off the hook with this one uh, it comes from <laughs> okay. ian can you put this into context, uh, this presentation into context, in, in terms of the high proportion of uh, GB sows that farrow outdoors? Um, can we learn from them? What can we apply here to the indoor sows? I think that's quite interesting, the relative difference between the two setups. Um, is, that, is that for me or? Yeah, David? Emma, if you, yeah, okay, if you yep, can address sorry. that. Is there um, learnings well, there? Yeah, I think I think there are. Um, one of the interesting things around that what we both discussed today is the fiber feeding and the kind of natural behavior, you know, the kind of decrease in stress. And um, one thing we've noticed, even with um, hyper -prolific, prolific sows um, outdoors, not necessarily in GB, but in Denmark, is because they have access to essentially natural fiber material, especially if they're farrowing in summer, they take on board that forage and have that kind of really um, uh, intense appetite about 10 days before farrowing and then five days and then they and then they reduce their appetite and they start nest building which is what I talked to you about but we don't find as many problems with constipation 
and with um, farrowing progression. So we might still have, even with the hyperlipics, we might still have issues with mortality because of all the other things. You know, you need to try and manage um, the piglets postnatally, which is very tricky outdoors, but we don't see the farrowing problems. So we don't see the stillbirth rates as high as we do in the kind of more restrictive environments or environments where we don't have the natural forage. And we, yeah, we don't see the constipation problems. Which, so I think that's where, where we can maybe learn a few things from the outdoor is, is yep. you know, providing a more natural, um, uh, for, you know, forage material for them and a more natural farrowing progression. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. And there is, uh, that... there is some evidence of that. Sorry, I was just going to oh, say yeah. there is some work on the outdoor Danish sows, not just our GBs that yep. um, d demonstrating these farrowing progressions aren't as long. Very good. Uh, I think the last question, as we're coming near the end, uh, is for David. It relates to, are there any negative effects of prolonged farrowing on subsequent uh, fertility and farrowings? I'm not sure if you have any information there, David. Yes, uh, actually there is uh, there are some uh, some research actually from this uh, Helsinki group from Claudio Oliviero in which they have tested the insemination success of uh, sows and then uh, once they had the picture of the insemination success, they were looking back at the previous recording of the farrowing length uh, and, and so on. And what they uh, saw is that uh, the sows that were uh, showing a failure on uh, on the insemination on the on the farrowing rate were actually uh, had had a previous uh, farrowing duration which was uh, uh, one hour and a half longer than uh, the rest of the sow. So apparently there is some correlation and actually the reasoning behind that is because uh, it is also related with the uterine involution uh, etc so it's uh, all the hormonal process as well uh, which is uh, which the sow needs to um, uh, to pass needs, needs to uh, yeah needs to uh, go over uh, after farrowing also uh, will have an influence on the subsequent uh, reproduction success so yes okay perfect uh, that kind of answers that first question that we had as well, Mark, um, about the obstetric yep. assistance. And so that combines a little bit there, which is nice. OK, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I think our time's up. So that's the last question actually answered, so which is fairly impressive. Um, I'd just like to finish by saying thank you on behalf of Al Alamon to both our speakers and especially you, Emma, uh, for helping us today. Yep. Uh, thank you, Dave, as well. Uh, and thank you uh, to all of you at home for attending. Um, I hope you found it useful. So thank you, Emma. Thank you, David. Thanks, thank everyone. you, Mark. Also. Yeah. Thanks, bye. 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 Bye.